I bought my first truck when I was 17 years old. It was this thing of beauty. It was this two-tone uh, uh, blue and, and, and charcoal gray, half-ton Chevrolet with a long bed sitting on these 33-inch tires, 1986 half-ton Chevrolet. Man, this thing of beauty. I love that truck. It, it, even with all of its flaws, I love that truck. But one of the flaws that it had it was that it was just short in the wire, which meant that as I was driving on the road, half the time I couldn't tell if my lights were on bright or if they were on dim. And normally this wasn't an issue, uh, but it became an issue for me one Saturday night. Uh, I was heading to the normal hangout spot to meet up with some friends, and, uh, and as I was driving down the road, I couldn't tell whether my lights were on bright or on dim. And to me, they seemed like they were on bright, but I just wasn't sure. Uh, so as I drove down the road for like a good five minutes, I, I began fearing that I was bright lighting everybody that I came into contact with. And so as I approached this car, I thought to myself, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to click this just to put it on a dim because I, I don't want to keep bright lighting people. And so I, as I approached the car, the car, I clicked the knob and, and to my surprise, the lights got brighter. And realizing that I just bright lighted the poor fellow in that car, I quickly hit the knob again, uh, which made my lights kind of do this flash. And I don't know if you know uh, much about the signals of the road, but uh, to have your lights flash at someone like that as you drive down the road usually says there's a police car somewhere down the road, watch out for them. And, and normally I might have got away with it, except for the guy that I just flashed my lights at was a trooper himself. And that guy wasted no time whatsoever to flash his lights at me. And his lights had a little bit more color than mine did as he did a U-turn to pull me over. And as he walked up to the truck, I, I, I looked through my mirror and I could tell that this guy, as, as, it, as, it, as it was, was actually the same guy who pulled me over about three weeks ago for doing something dumb. And I remember that night, I mean, like it was yesterday, even right now, but that guy wrote me hard during that, during that traffic stop and, and he, he poured into me and, and I was afraid of hearing all that again. So, uh, so, so as he walked up to the door, as he stood right beside my window, it's not the smartest thing to do. But I began talking first. And I looked at him and I said, sir, man, I didn't mean to do this. I, I, I apologize. He, my, my truck doesn't tell me if it's on bright or if it's on dim. And I thought it was on bright. I didn't want to bright light everybody. So I clicked it really fast. And, and I went on and I talked a mile, uh, 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 I mean, a second, just trying to get this out to him. And, of course, he went through everything to make sure I wasn't lying to him and, and, uh, and told me to tell my dad and see if my dad could fix it, those kinds of things. But sitting there on the side of the road and afraid of facing some kind of punishment, I immediately began pleading my case. Because that's what we do, isn't it? Whenever we feel accused or blamed of something that we feel innocent about, we'll defend ourselves until we are blue in the face. And maybe you've done this at some point in your life. Maybe it was with a sibling growing up and they accused you of taking the last cookie or something. It's something silly, but, but you didn't take it and you're not going to take the blame for it. Or maybe your parents accused you of breaking something within the house. Maybe you were accused of messing up at work, doing something you shouldn't have done at work. Or maybe you even sat on the side of the road with a cop yourself and pledged your case before him or her. The truth is, we never want to take the fall when we're innocent. And we especially don't want to take the fall for someone else when we're not guilty. So any time that we're accused of something, we'll plead our innocence and if necessary, we're going to point fingers at people we think might be guilty. And we'll do this. We'll defend ourselves, even over the smallest and the silliest of things. Which is what makes the trial of Jesus all the more eye-opening and unique. Jesus does something in this trial that we would rarely, if ever, do. We see this in Matthew chapter 27. <coughs> and by this point in the gospel, Jesus has already... Uh, been arrested in the garden, and, 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 and since that time, he's faced some angry Jewish religious leaders who are just finding any reason in the world to try to put him to death. And, and so finally, they, they, they find a reason. They accuse Jesus of blasphemy, and they sentence him to death. And after that sentence is issued, man, they begin tearing into Jesus. I mean, mocking him and spitting in his face and beating him and slapping him. All of this until morning came, and they finally handed him over to Pilate. And Jesus stands, and that's where we pick up in, in, in our narrative today, Jesus standing in our passage, Jesus standing on trial before Pilate, already bruised and already bleeding. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 11, we read this. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, You have said so. Now I want you to understand a few things about this moment. I mean, first of all, Pilate has to be 
pretty puzzled uh, about all of this at this point. I mean, put yourself in Pilate's shoes. Pilate's been around kings and rulers of various levels all of his life. And to say that Jesus was a king while, while being arrested and beaten already, man, it would have seemed a little bit strange to Pilate because Jesus doesn't appear, doesn't look like a king. But Pilate also realizes that to claim to be a king was a pretty heavy offense in a Roman-controlled area. I mean, to say that you're a king was, is basically to say you're a threat against Caesar. It's to say that you are revolting against or rebelling against the, the empire, and that's not taken lightly in Roman court. If found guilty of that in a Roman court, the punishment is death, period. No questions asked. But even after Jesus does, but even while Jesus doesn't look like a king to Pilate, and, and even while he doesn't appear to be any kind of threat, Pilate still begins the trial. And when he asks Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus responds back by basically saying, Yeah, what you say is true, because after all, Jesus is the king of the Jews. He's the king of everyone. But while true, this statement infuriates the Jewish religious leaders. And these men who were already angry, man begin making statements, or uh, already angry about these statements makes their blood begin to boil all the more. And, and so they start shouting. In this moment, they start shouting all these accusations at Jesus because they deem what he just said to be blasphemous. And, and while Matthew doesn't tell us exactly what Jesus, or what they accuse Jesus of saying or, or doing here, Luke gives a little bit more insight in Luke chapter 23, verses 1 through 5. Luke tells that, that Jesus was accused of several things. He was accused of misleading the Jewish nation and, and forbidding them to give tribute to Caesar. He, he was accused of, of saying that, that he himself was a king. And when Pilate starts suggesting that, that Jesus was innocent, the religious leaders begin accusing, accusing Jesus of stirring up the crowds, stirring up the people, teaching throughout all of Judea, from Galilee to Jerusalem. It's at this point, with that last accusation, that the whole ordeal comes closely, hits closely to home for Pilate. You see, Roman governors didn't appreciate stirred up crowds. And if it ever appeared that a Roman governor lost control of the crowds, that governor is going to lose his job. So this last accusation has direct implications to Pilate himself. This last accusation is likely going to push Pilate to at least do something. Yet with all these accusations, with everybody in chaos and an uproar, we look over at Jesus and we see Jesus is steady and sure. Check this out. Matthew 27, verse 12 says, But when he, when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. And if this were us, man, we're fearing our lives. Or I mean, we might interject at, at any moment, shouting that what they're saying isn't true. Just look at Peter last week, as we talked about him last week. Peter just, just was responding in, in, in an instant, saying, This isn't true. It's false. It's false. It's false. But Jesus says nothing at all, gave no answer. It's a strange response, to say the least. Pilate would have expected Jesus to say something. Jesus says nothing. So in verse 13, Pilate begins trying to, to push Jesus, to get Jesus' side of the story. And, and he asks Jesus, he says, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? In other words, dude, they're, they're throwing lofty charge after lofty charge. Don't you have something to say for yourself? Let me hear your side of the story. But verse 14 says, Jesus gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Pilate had never seen anything like it. Standing before a judge, everyone, and I mean everyone, defends themselves. Even if they're guilty, man, they're saying, give me my lawyer so I can try to get a lighter sentence, right? No one is silent. Especially when it comes to charges on this level. I mean, this is a serious uh, enough offense for the death penalty. And when faced with death or just pain of any sort, everyone protects themselves. Th think about it for a moment. I mean, if we, if we start to fall down for whatever reason, if we start to fall down, we, our immediate reaction is always to try and catch ourselves, to try to limit the impact, limit the damage. When life seems threatened and everything seems in danger, we retreat to find safety and when faced with the death penalty you better believe every one of us are defending our case i mean even paul in the book of acts defends his case everyone who's ever faced a death penalty before Pilate defended their case except for jesus jesus didn't say a word not even to a single outlandish untrue charge and understand jesus isn't silent because he's guilty 
that Jesus is the only man who's ever walked this earth to ever go every single day without ever doing anything wrong. He's the only sinless man to ever be on this earth. And so Jesus, if anyone's ever been innocent, it's been Jesus. And he's not silent because he has no defense to stand upon or, or, or because, you know, he, he, he doesn't know how to argue his way out of it. He feels trapped. Uh, he's, not, he's not silent because of that. I mean, Jesus could have easily won this case. He, he's done it time and time again as, as the Jewish religious leaders come at him and, and throw accusation after accusation or try to trap him all throughout his ministry. Jesus always, always won those cases. I mean, every story. We see the Jewish religious leaders walking away frustrated and angry because in his infinite wisdom, Jesus won that battle again. So Jesus could have easily argued his way out of this one too. But instead he says nothing at all. In a moment when self-defense and self-preservation would naturally run high, remember Peter last week? Jesus just sits there and takes it. And this has steep ramifications. According to, to Roman law, to, to give no defense was basically to confess or admit that you're guilty. So even while Jesus is completely innocent, his silence says, I'm guilty. And Jesus knows this. And Jesus knows that by, by choosing to say nothing at all, Jesus is choosing, Jesus chose the cross. And not just the cross, but everything that goes with the cross. He chose the spit and the insults. He chose the scourging and where, where, where his back would just be ripped open time and time again. And he chose the nail, uh, the, the crown of thorns on his head. He, he chose his beard being ripped out. He chose the nails in his hands and in his feet. And he chose the cup of God's wrath where God would just forsake him and, and, and abandon him in that moment on the cross. And we, like Pilate, are amazed and we ask the question, why? If faced with this kind of, of penalty, if faced with death, if faced with any of this, or, uh, all of us would naturally defend ourselves when innocent. So if that's the case, why does Jesus say nothing at all? And it turns out that the answer for this is actually tucked away in an old prophetic book. In Isaiah chapter 52, uh, beginning in verse 13, it goes all the way through chapter 53, uh, it offers us this portion of Scripture that's often been called the suffering servant passage. And that passage provides these statements uh, about Jesus that, that we find true throughout the gospel stories, and especially during these trials. And we don't have time to read that. I want to encourage you to go read chapters or Isaiah chapter 52 and 53 later on today. Uh, it's within these verses that we see the plan of God laid out plain for us. And years before Jesus ever walked this earth, Isaiah writes about his silence. And he tells us why. Look at Isaiah chapter 53, beginning in verse 5. It says, But he was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. This, this is what Isaiah is telling us. We, all of us, all of humanity, have sinned. And we could quote any number of verses throughout Scripture that, that remind us of this truth. There are a plethora of them, but if I had to guess, we really don't have to because we already know. We already know we've sinned. Because we've all failed at some point, right? We've all fallen. We've all made any number of mistakes, and we've all wandered away and taken our own path, even when we knew it wasn't right. Which means we're the guilty ones. We're the ones who deserve the punishment that we read about in Isaiah 52 and 53. Yet Jesus chose the cross for us. Jesus chose to become that ultimate sacrifice for our sins. So as verse 5 points out, while we were the ones who should have been pierced, Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. And while we were the ones who should have been crushed, Jesus was crushed for our iniquities. And because he received that chastisement, that punishment for us, we can now have peace. A peace unknown, a peace not offered in this world. A peace that can only come from God alone. And because he took the blows, because he was wounded, we can now be spiritually healed. We can be saved. And Jesus knew that, that the only way we could receive this, the only way we could receive salvation, forgiveness, redemption, peace, healing, anything, 
was if he took the cross for us, if he took the punishment of, of God for us, if he became our sacrifice. So as Isaiah foretold, and as the gospel shows, Jesus took all of our sins. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all, every sin ever committed. From, from the sins we may not even realize we've committed to the sins that still haunt us to this day that we committed years and years ago. Jesus took all of that, took all of it upon himself, paid for it all. And he chose to cover it all with his blood through his perfect sacrifice. And again, it wouldn't be easy. I mean, the cross and the cup of God's wrath, and none of that's going to be easy. It's why we saw Jesus struggling so hard in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. But Jesus chose it anyways. Because of that, as Isaiah 53 verse 7 says, He was oppressed and He was afflicted, yet He opened not His mouth. Knowing what was coming, knowing what He would face, knowing that the cross was waiting for Him on the other side of this trial, Jesus opened not His mouth. And then Isaiah gives us this wonderful image of what it looks like in this picture here. And Isaiah says that He did all this because like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before it shears is silent, so He opened not His mouth. And we come back to that question, why did Jesus stay silent? Why did Jesus choose the cross? Why didn't Jesus defend himself? And the answer is quite simple. Jesus chose the cross because Jesus chose you. And through his silence, Jesus has everything we've ever needed to hear. Standing on trial, Jesus knew exactly what was coming. Jesus knew that, that by remaining silent, that, that he stood as a lamb before the slaughter with the cross waiting for him on the other side of this trial. And, and he accepted it anyways because, and, and I don't want you to miss this, when Jesus looked on the other side of the cross, when Jesus looked on the other side of that pain, on the other side of the wrath of God, he saw you and he saw me. And seeing us, he loved us. And loving us, he let go of his rights, refused to plead his case. Because Jesus would rather have you than to be right in this moment. Jesus would rather have you than defend his innocence and be found not guilty. Jesus would rather have you for all of eternity, no matter the cost, no matter what. So I don't know where you're at today. I don't know where you're at physically or spiritually. But wherever you are, I want you to know this because I think Jesus wants you to know this. Jesus loves you this much. I mean, he loves you so much that he chose the cross and all of its punishment for you. And whether you're a, a longtime Christ follower, you're not a Christ follower at all. Jesus loves you and Jesus chose you. And the only question is, will you choose him? But will you have a relationship with Jesus? Or if you already have a relationship with him, will you choose to deepen that relationship with him? If you'd like to choose Jesus today, whether that's for the first time or just or, or to have a deeper relationship with Him, but you're not sure what that looks like, I, I want to encourage you, send me an email, as, as, was, as was shown at the earlier part of the, uh, of the video, send me an email, drop me a message on Facebook, because we'd love to speak with you today. I'd love to talk with you about that. But wherever you are, know this today. Think about this today. Pause and reflect on this today. Jesus could have easily avoided the cross. He could have won that trial hands down, made them look like fools and walked away a free man. But he refused to do so. And the reason for that is simple. And his great love for us, Jesus chose the cross because Jesus chose you. And Father, we thank you. Jesus, we thank you that that you have chosen us. And, and while we understand the desire and the need to defend our case and, 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 and to be found not guilty, we thank you that even in all of that, God, you were silent. And that your silence is everything that we need to know about. Through your silence, you said the most, Lord, that, that your love for us is selfless and sure. God, I pray if there's someone in the day that, that isn't experiencing that love or doesn't feel that love for whatever reason, God, that, that this message, Lord, this your word, your silence here will be everything we need to know. That it will remind us of your love for us. And God, that that would launch us into a deeper relationship with you. 
God, we thank you that you chose the cross in their place. And we thank you that you chose us. We pray this in your son's most wonderful name.